Rails trains number three and four carried their last RPO cars between New York and Washington. On that day, the RPO ceased after 113 years of continuous service on that route. In Colorado, the last RPOs made their runs in 1967. Railway post office.
afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome aboard the Colorado Historical Society's Georgetown Loop Railroad. We'll be underway in just a couple of moments now. But first, we have a few safety rules to cover to be sure your ride is safe and enjoyable. First of all, no smoking on the train or at the depots or the platforms. We would like to ask that no one stand on the seats or sit on the side rails of the cars. The rocking motion of the train might cause you to lose your balance. We don't want anyone having a fall. Another important rule, especially for children, please don't reach from the train at passing tree limbs and other close objects. Very dangerous. They could grab you back and give an injury. We also ask that once you've chosen a seat, please remain in that particular car while the train is in motion. It's rather dangerous to walk the connecting plates between the cars while we're moving. You're welcome to get up and move about in that car or stand up and take pictures. No problem. Little ones can stand on a seat with an adult hand on them so they can see over the side. And if you have any trash to dispose of, there is a waste basket in each car tucked under one of the seats. We do appreciate you using those. Please don't throw anything from the train. If you have any questions during your ride today, feel free to ask your train crew. Your conductor today is Shane. I'm Ron, your brakeman. If you have any questions about our railroad, the Georgetown Silver Bloom area, or maybe your Colorado travels, we'd be glad to answer questions. If you're taking the tour of the Lebanon Silver Mine, we'll be stopping at the mine 10 minutes into the downhill ride. We'll announce when we get there. You'll be off with your tour guides for an hour and a quarter and back to the boarding platform at the mine in time to pick up the next scheduled run of the train to finish your entire train ride. might notice the dining coaches that we have parked here in the Silver Plume Yards. We do run dinner trains Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays typically throughout the summer. Very fine dinner trains and festival trains on into the fall and Santa trains throughout. Okay folks we're about to move. Make sure you're holding on or in a seat. Three toots on the whistle, that means we're underway going backwards. Now you might notice the locomotive is running backwards. The reason for that, the valley is so narrow here, we don't have room for turnaround facilities at either end of our railroad, so for the downhill ride, we place the engine in reverse at the back or lean end of the train. When we get to Devil's Gate Station, we'll bring the engine back to the front of the train on the passing track for the uphill ride. The railroad you're riding today is a reconstructed portion of the old Colorado and Southern Narrow Gauge Railway that used to operate all the way from Denver, 54 miles by rail, up here to Silver Plume, prior to 1939. Going back in history, though, the first mountain railroad in Colorado was the Colorado Central Company. They began building west of Denver in 1870, just one year after the first transcontinental railway was completed. They followed Clear Creek, first out to Golden, then up Clear Creek Canyon to Idaho Springs. Another branch went up to Blackhawk in Central City, and the Idaho Springs branch continued west, arriving in Georgetown by 1877. Shortly after that, the Georgetown Breckenridge and Blendwood Company was formed to continue the railroad west of Georgetown. Their plans were to build all the way west to the Continental Divide, tunnel beneath Lovell Pass, and continue to the rich mining communities of Breckenridge and Linda. However, after they got the mine built over the loop to Silver Plume, and then only five miles further to Greymont, or Tinkerville as we know it today, the parent company of the railroad purchased another mine that had already been serving Breckenridge and Linda. So they didn't need to continue this one after all, and they cut the end of the line back to Silver Plume. Around 1900, the Colorado and Southern Company took over the entire line from Denver to Silver Plume. If you look off the left side of the train now, you will see Clear Creek coming its way to the Georgetown Valley. That's the stream that gave our county its name, Clear Creek County, of which Georgetown is the county seat. Yes, that water is just as cold as it looks because it's coming directly from Snowmelt on the continental divide, about 12 miles west of here. Find their way to the Gulf of Mexico. 
Mexico by the Platte, Missouri, and Mississippi. In the early days, they called this railroad a stub-in branch line out of Denver. It was a very busy and successful railway, however. It brought the miners and their families and supplies up to the mountain mining communities. It also took a lot of the rich gold and silver ore back down the hill to the smelters near Golden and Denver for processing. That continued very well until the year 1893, the year of the so-called silver crash. The Sherman Silver Purchase Act was repealed that year, and the price of silver dropped so low, most of the silver mines shut down and never did reopen. Fortunately for this railroad, gold mining continued near Idaho Springs of Central City, and this upper portion of the railway was kept alive with tourism. It was long before this railroad ride, for the Georgetown Loop became nationally and internationally known as a scenic and engineering marvel of the 19th century. Thousands of people came to ride the train like you're riding it today. Central timetable showed people hopping aboard the train at 8.05 a.m. in the morning at Denver Union Station, arriving at Silver Plum at 12 o'clock noon, two hours spent there, enjoying the picnic lunch, and returning to Denver at 2 p.m., getting downtown to Denver at 6 p.m. in the evening. They were running as many as seven trains a day for this trip. It was so popular. Between 1905 and 1918, a short railroad called the Argentine Central operated further out of Silverton on 7% grades and switchbacks to the mining town of Waldorf at 11,500 feet where they once had the highest U.S. post office. Waldorf is a ghost town today. Well, that little railroad didn't just stop there. It went to the top of 13,500 foot Mount McClellan. Grand views of the Rocky Mountains. They called that railroad the Stairway to the Stars. Your service on this railroad, however, was quite lively on you to the 1920s, but at that time automobiles and roads were gaining much popularity, and it wasn't long before most people preferred that mode of transportation to the old narrow gauge train. Colorado and Southern finally discontinued their regular passenger service up here in 1927. They continued to operate a couple of mixed trains a week for several more years, but by the late 1930s, the railroad business was so bad they filed for abandonment. That was granted to the government between 1939 and 1941. All the rails and bridges were torn out between Silver Plum, Georgetown, Idaho Springs, Central City, and Golden. In the early 1960s, the highway department began planning the new interstate highway up this valley. The original plans would have destroyed this railroad train and much of the mining history here. The Colorado Historical Society was convinced that it should be saved for rebuilding. And they had the highway relocated over to the north side of the valley where you see it right today. We began to rebuild this railroad on the original grade starting in the Silver Blue Band in 1973. With the help of the United States Navy Seabees, we had enough track laid by 1975 to begin railroad operations here and we've operated every year since that time.
it's a tough crowd, she, but we're trying. <laughs> Our railroad, like the original GBNL, is three foot narrow gauge, 36 inches between the rails as compared to standard gauge lines in our country, where the rails are four feet, eight and one half inches apart. In the early days of mountain railroad building, they preferred narrow gauge usually. The cost was a third that of a standard gauge line. The smaller engines and cars can negotiate tighter curves and heavier grades. And the road bed did not have to be built as wide. A very important factor to building through rugged terrain, like this huge boulder field we're passing through right now. Imagine hand building a railroad through a terrain like this in the 1880s. They had to hand drill these rocks, pack the holes with black powder, and blow them into pieces small enough to build a hand or horse team. Very difficult and dangerous work. That's how all the early Colorado Mountain Railways were built. Valley? The answer is no, especially silver mining. Most of it ended in 1893, actually. Uh, there is still a lot of silver left in these mountains, but it's far too expensive to get it out for what it's worth. Even at the high prices of gold these days, it's difficult to make a profit in gold mining. A few small operations near Idaho Springs and Central City. The largest gold mining operation in Colorado today is down at Cripple Creek on the west side of Pikes Peak. And the largest mine in Clear Creek County, in fact, our largest industry here in Clear Creek County, is the Henderson Molybdenum Mine up on Highway 40 near Berthoud Pass. If you're not sure what molybdenum is, it is a metallic element which is used in the hardening of steel primarily. Okay, here we go. Now, if you're not familiar with the Lebanon Mine, look to the left. You'll notice the folks who just got off have hiked down the trail a ways. 
They're standing in front of a small wooden portal on the side of the mountain right now, which is the entrance to the Everett Silver Mine, a sister mine to the Lebanon, which is further down the trail by the buildings where the actual tour takes place. A sister mine means those two mines are connected with a cross tunnel back inside the mountain. This upper Clear Creek Valley produced over $200 million worth of silver in the late 19th century. And those are the figures measured in the 19th century, equates to well over $2 billion today, today's prices. That did earn for Georgetown the nickname Silver Queen of the Rockies. Georgetown took its name from George Griffith, one of the early settlers of the valley. And the little mining town of Silver Bloom, where most of the miners used to live, was named for the blue or feather-shaped crystals of pure silver found in some of these mines. You might keep your eyes open for wildlife. We do see mule deer in the forest, sometimes not far from the train. And the trees you see here are mostly lodgepole and liver pine, a lot of Douglas fir and aspen trees, smaller bushes of the willow, mount mahogany, and mount maple. Are the result of the epidemic of pine beetle that hits the lodgepole pine. On the right side of the train now, we're passing the Hall Tunnel, another early silver mine. You see the rock line trains leading back toward the mountain where the tunnel is located, the stone foundation of the old workhouse, and the Ingersoll Rand air compressor is still there that once ran the drills and supplied fresh air to the tunnel. The Hall Tunnel is an interesting history. It started as a transportation tunnel.
down to the left are Devil's Gate Station. Those little wooden platforms on the bridge are historically correct. The original high bridge had those, as did many other early railway trestles around the country. They originally held water barrels in case of fires started on the bridge by the coal and wood burning steam locomotives. We have little fire danger from our locomotive as it is an oil burner. Under the far end of the bridge, you see old U.S. Highway 6, the predecessor of I-70. It made an S-shaped curve as part of the canyon on its way to Logan Pass. Over on the left side, there's a stone monument placed next to the old highway. It was put there in 1949 by the Colorado Historical Society to commemorate the original Georgetown Hoover Road and High Bridge that had been torn down 10 years earlier. They had no idea when they placed the monument that 35 years in the future would see this railroad rebuilt with trains again operating over the loop. The locomotive pulling your train today, number 12, is an oil burning steam locomotive. It was built that way in 1928 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is a 262 Prairie type engine, weighs 41 tons, and it originally worked for over 40 years on the island of Maui in Hawaii at the Kahului Railroad, where it hauled sugarcane and pineapple products. For that reason, we still affectionately call this engine the Pineapple Princess. This is a rather small steam locomotive. It is not capable of pulling all nine of our cars back up the hill to Silver Blue. We need helper service. If you look over to the left, across our parking lot, you will see number 1203 diesel electric engine waiting for us. It will be added to the consist on the upfield ride for the additional power. That's an interesting engine too. It was built in 1946 by the Porter Company of Pittsburgh. It's an 86-ton diesel electric, the largest uh, narrow-gauge diesel in service in our country today. It originally worked on the U.S. Jukes and narrow-gauge line in Plaster City, California. The cars you're riding in today are all original narrow-gauge freight cars, over 100 years old now. They originally served on the Denver and Rio Grande Western narrow-gauge lines in southwestern Colorado, portions of which remain today, as the famous Durango Silverton narrow-gauge line and the Cobras and Toltec Scenic Railway operating from Chama, New Mexico to Antonito, Colorado. One exception, the flat orange car on the back of our train is an all-steel car built in Skagway, Alaska in the 1960s for use as a container car on the White Pass and Yukon Narrow Gauge Railway. Two longs, a short, and a long now on our whistle as we cross the old road to the Lebanon Silver Mine. National Standard Crossing Signal. Reach 
Welcome back guys. <laughs> 